So welcome uh, to the Access Sorrow Registry Showcase. We're all very excited to share with you what we have been working on. Um, and we hope you like what you see. Uh, next slide, please, John. I'll just go through quickly um, some housekeeping. Oh, sorry, the agenda for today. And then some housekeeping, and then we'll get on our way. So today we'll give you an introduction of who we are, um, our PRA. We hope you've heard of us before, but in case you haven't, just give you a little overview. Um, and then we'll give a little overview of what the training sessions will entail, this one and the others. Uh, set some expectations, introduce you to the registry, and the lovely John from BWC will give you a demonstration of the registry. And um, then we will introduce the public portal and another demonstration of the public portal, um, and then our very own uh, registry expert, Pam, will give you more insight on training, and then we will have about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, so we will not be taking questions during the webinar, uh, during the demonstration, but at the end we will be taking questions. Um, it's a very short amount of time, and there are many of you online, so please um, do use the Q&A to put any questions in there that you have. Uh, next slide, please, John, um, just to show everyone how to ask a question. Yeah, so if you just click on the Q&A bar at the bottom, that's where you can ask questions. There are There is a functionality to upvote a question. Um, if you want it answered live today, we will do our best to get to all of them. And those that we can't answer, we will do our best to get um, answers to you in writing. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, just a reminder that this is being recorded and the recording will be made available at the end uh, um, of the webinar in the next day or two. And we will share that on our website as well as in an email with everybody who attends today. Yeah, I think that's it for the housekeeping rules. Uh, so without further ado, I will pass you on to our great leader, our CEO, uh, Frank Denton to introduce you to our PRA. Thanks, Isabella. Good morning, everybody. I uh, appreciate everybody's interest in this uh, launch of the Excess Solar Register. I think we've got about 300 people with us today, so that shows uh, how much interest there is in this. We are on track to go live at this registry on. December the 1st, we did a successful launch over the weekend, a bit of a nail biter, uh, but very successful and we're ready to go on December the 1st. And that's gonna give people a few weeks if they wanna go in and get used to the system before the government's excess soil regulation comes into effect on January 1st, 2022. So most of you haven't worked with RPRA before, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of our history, what we were set up to do, and uh, what our role is going to be in uh, implementing this regulation. So we were created five years ago, five years ago, November 30th, actually, turning five, uh, to be the regulatory authority under Ontario's new approach to recovering resources from waste. So waste diversion uh, was our primary, was our mandate when we were set up. We're accountable to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. We work really closely with the ministry but we're an independent body, we're not part of government, we are a, uh, we are a cost recovery organization, which is why we're, we're, we're the fees attached with using this registry. So until 2020, our mandate was focused on waste diversion. Uh, in Ontario, as I'm sure everybody knows, we've got a number of recycling programs, for tires, electronics, household hazardous waste, blue box. In 2016, the legislation that created RPRA set up an extended boost of responsibility model for waste diversion. So there's a big reform going on in Ontario. But as consumers, it's not very visible, but it, uh, it means a lot to the businesses that are affected. So under the new system, individual producers of consumer goods that are covered are responsible for ensuring that targets are met to divert waste to new resources. And that's working really well, large scale reform, but that's not why we're here today. Um, to, uh, to implement the waste diversion programs, we're required to build a registry to gather and track data on what goods are being supplied into Ontario and how those, the, um, 
you know, the waste produced by those goods is being managed to meet targets. So then in 2020, because we had built this registry successfully, the government expanded our mandate so that we could leverage the registry for other kinds of programs under the Environmental Protection Act. And then last spring, the minister directed us to develop a registry portal to implement the new excess soils regulation. That regulation, as you probably know, was published in late 2019, it comes into force January 1st. So that's why we're here. That portal's now ready to go. We're gonna show it to you, uh, walk you through it. We work really closely with the minister on this project. Um, they're implementing the regulation. They're the regulator, just like the Ministry of Environment is on, on many uh, regulations. But they need this registry uh, to implement. And our role is to develop the registry to support their implementation and to support users of the registry like yourselves. So we're really grateful for the input we got from industry. Uh, there was an excess soil industry stakeholder working group um, that worked really well um, and allowed us to build a portal through uh, really strong collaboration. Uh, we're hope, we hope that you, you find that it meets your needs as the business is required to use it. Um, it's intended to be efficient, user-friendly, and easily integrate into your business practices. And if you have trouble with it, I'm sure we'll hear about it, but we think you're going to find it uh, pretty easy to use. So it's going to be a, it's going to have a searchable database that the public can access so they can find information about how excess soil was moving around through Ontario. And then once we go live on December 1st, we will, our responsibility will to support the users of the registry. And that includes all the businesses that are required to use it under the ministry's regulation and the ministry itself as a user as well. So again, we're implementing the regulation. Um, uh, the ministry is implementing the regulation around the compliance program. We are creating and running the registry and helping users in navigating it. So with that, I am going to turn the chair over to Pam Castillo to show how, us how this all works. Pam? Hi, thanks, Frank. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pam Castillo. Um, I'm the Compliance Manager of Registry Support here at Rupra. Um, and uh, welcome everyone. We are very excited to uh, demonstrate what the registry is. And just, I wanted to add on a little bit to what Frank had said earlier, um, that we've been working collaboratively uh, with the ministry uh, in partnership with the industry working group uh, alongside PwC uh, to ensure that the development of the, of the registry from the beginning uh, or from the spring of this year up until where we are now has been a very collaborative approach where we've uh, received industry input to ensure that this is a um, user-friendly and functional registry uh, for the regulated community when they need to um, log into the system and initiate a notice filing. So um, we, we've worked many months to develop and build the registry. And last month, we actually conducted a conference room pilot with the industry stakeholder group. Um, and essentially, this three-day workshop allowed um, a select uh, handful of people to get a firsthand experience of the solution. And it served several functions, um, uh, which leads us here to, to our launch date, where we were able to determine uh, user training needs. So we tested walkthrough guides to ensure that it supported users in the filing of a notice. Uh, it also served the function of identifying uh, any issues prior to the goal live date. So again, testing that it was user friendly and the functionality of the system itself. Uh, we received great feedback uh, from the participants uh, and it allowed us to identify uh, any sort of improvements such as wording and label, labels within the pages. And we hope that when you see the system yourselves, you'll be able to, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find that it is again, a user friendly and functional registry. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So what is the registry? Um, so as Frank had said, um, when we first built um, the, the registry portals back in 2018, it, we were mandated to um, create a digital reporting system for the regulated community as it relates to the uh, RRCEA programs. And so data collected within the registry 
uh, has commonalities against all of the, the registry portals that we've built to date, and that includes collecting information about uh, business entities. So things like the name of the company, the CRA number, name, address, and contact information. And all of that information, this database uh, supports um, the producers um, entering their supply data, which includes their sales data and any sort of supply chain information. Um, and that does, and what that serves is our functionality to enforce um, the regulations under the RCEA. A little bit different with the excess soils program. So obviously it'll be a repository for information. It's a, it's a database um, and it is serving the excess soils industry uh, community. And we will be collecting the same sort of information as it relates to a company. So the name, address and contact information. But it also has key features that are a little bit different. Um, we will be tracking the soil data, uh, soil details as it relates to volume and quality of soil that is moving from a project area or is being transported to a reuse site. And it also has location data about the property itself. And this information um, will, will serve the, um, the ministry's uh, compliance and enforcement to ensure that you know, soil is being managed responsibly. And so um, that's kind of like a high level overview of what the registry data uh, entails. And with, with the um, registry build itself and the digital platform, you know, it's always been very key for, for us to, um, that there is commercially sensitive information that, that is input into the system. So, you know, the registry is always built um, taking into consideration, you know, the security uh, of people's information. So before I hand it over to um, John, I really just want to say as well that, um, as Frank mentioned earlier, um, the authority is RIPRA. We are responsible for establishing and maintaining the registry. Um, and however, the Ministry of the Environment uh, will continue to be responsible for the policy uh, and the compliance and enforcement uh, activities under the excess soils regulations. So um, when we go live on December 1st, there will be registry support available to um, the regulated parties, but it will be limited in the sense that we will not be able to provide any sort of advice or answer any questions as it relates to the regulation itself. Um, that is out of scope for, for the service that we're offering uh, to yourselves and the ministry. Um, so just be mindful of that. And um, if there are Q&As um, at the end of the session that are regulated, um, regulatory questions, uh, we will be flipping uh, those questions over to the ministry and, and hopefully be able to provide an answer via that avenue. So, um, John, over to you. Great, perfect. Thank you very much, Pam. Um, good morning, everybody. So my name is John Conway. I am a functions, functional specialist here at PwC Canada. And it's my absolute pleasure to run you through the first of our three training sessions for the Excess Soils Registry Portal. Um, full disclosure, I'm actually gonna turn my camera off because my laptop does sound like it's about to uh, start smoking with all the screens that I'm sharing at once. So I am, I am here, but I'm just going to turn my camera off for this. So this is the first of three training sessions that have been planned in order to help industry professionals on how to best utilize the registry. This session will be an introduction to the registry. We'll go through account creation and then also access to the public portal. As you'll see here, the next two sessions are actually deeper dives into two of the three filing types. To set some expectations for these sessions, we will be showcasing the technical features of the registry, and that's as it exists today. We'll be going through the functionality that's been built. So what that means is we will not be going into any of the legal requirements of the regulation itself, nor its interpretation, or any of its enforcement. So the way we're gonna do that is I will do a brief overview of the topics by using a slide deck, and then we will do a live demonstration. So we have allocated that 15 minutes for a Q&A, and as you've already heard, 
RPRA is available to answer any other questions that you may have. So to start our session this morning, we are gonna be doing an introduction to the registry portal. As I alluded to, first I'll give that brief overview of the registry, go over some of the excess soil program essentials, and then we will open up the registry itself for the demonstration. For the excess soil program specifically, there are three programs, oh, sorry, three portals that make up the registry. First, the registry for industry users. This is where the industry users can log in with their account details. They'll be able to complete the excess soil filings and meet those compliance requirements. And I'll show that shortly. Secondly, we have the public soils registry. This is where certain details that are associated with those registry filings will be shared for public access. And I'll also demonstrate this later today. Finally, the third portal is the ministry portal. So as we'll go into information that's included in the excess soil notice filings is shared with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks in order to manage their compliance and policy efforts. But focusing on one portal to start off with, we're going to start with the registry portal itself this morning. So as I just said, this portal is for industry users in order to complete and view their filings. An industry user has the ability to create an account in order to make those new filings. They can update or finalize any of their existing filings, or they can access those filings that may have been previously created. In order to actually access the registry, you can use the link that is listed here, or you can visit registry.rpra.ca directly. So before we jump into the portal, there are a few fundamentals that I'd like to cover so that you have a bit more context during the demonstration itself. As you see here, I'll be walking through how to create an account, we'll verify an email address, and we'll create a secure password. Then we will enroll in the Access Soil program and we will actually initiate a filing. Then we will discuss some of the options available to you in order to provide access to your filing to other users or to other companies. So first things first, after accessing that registry login page through registry.rpra.ca, you will see a registry sign-in page. And so if you do not yet have that registry account, you can click on the create a new account button in order to start the account creation process. The account creation process is a simple four-step process. It will require entering in your CRA business number, details of your business, and then also building a personal profile too. Once that's all been done, you can set a secure password so that you can log into the registry at a later time. So once that account is created and you've successfully logged into the registry, you'll be taken to this screen, which is the program selection page. And then on this page, as you can see, you can select the excess soil program icon in order to register your account with this specific program. Then after you've successfully enrolled in the Excess Soil program, the icon is going to turn green and you can click it again to be taken onto the program's homepage. All of this will be covered in the demonstration shortly. So from the Excess Soil program homepage, you'll be able to initiate a new notice filing. And for those that are not aware, there are three different types of filings that can be completed by the registry portal. We have the Residential Development Soil Depot Notice, an RDSD is defined as a soil bank storage site that is temporarily operated for the purpose of managing excess soil that will ultimately be transported to a reuse site. Next, we have our reuse site notice. And a reuse site is a site at which excess soil is used for an identifiable beneficial purpose. Then finally, the project area notice. The project area refers to a single property or adjoining properties on which a project is carried out. So we will be completing more training sessions on both the reuse and the project area filings over the next few weeks. And we will be recording a video on the RDSD notice filing type. Okay, so before we dive into the demo, I've got just a couple of slides here about the options that are available to you in order to share that workload of completing a notice. And you can share this with another person or another company. So firstly, as a baseline, it is important to note that there is no requirement to share your filing with any other party. 
And a user can totally create and complete that filing independently if they choose to. However, on this slide, I've built out a few scenarios just to explain those options that are available to you. So the first scenario here is titled user management. So should our site owner, Bob from Soil Co Company, choose to give access to all of his filings to another person, he can add that person as a user to his account. All of these users that Bob adds to his account can access all of the filings that Soil Co has previously created. They can make submissions, they can make payments, and they can also see financial information. So in this specific example, you can see that Bob has added his project manager, Sarah, to his account as a secondary user, and she can access all three of those filings, or she can choose to create new filings on behalf of Soil Co. In the second example, Bob is the owner of Soil Co, but does not want to create an account in the registry. So in order to comply with its requirement to file the notice filing, Soil Co has decided to give Terry at Compo Soil authorized permission via a written contractual arrangement. And this allows them to complete notice filings and pay fees on Soil Co's behalf. So as an authorized person, Terry from Compo Soil can create an account and he can initiate those notice filings complete that relevant information and submit the payments all on behalf of Soil Code. Important to note though, those initial and final submission declaration forms, they must still be completed by Soil Code. That authorized person, so Terry, he can only initiate a notice in the registry if he's permitted to do so as well by that project leader, the owner, or the operator of the site. And then in our final example, Bob, he's still the owner of Soil Co, but he has contracted Big Dirt Inc. to work with them. So Soil Co, they have a registered account within the registry and they will initiate the filing, but they understand that Big Dirt is working on site. And so they will have access to additional information, which would be required to complete a notice. So for that reason, Bob from Soil Co provides notice access to Big Dirt for one filing in particular filing N0023 highlighted there. This is gonna allow any registered user within Big Dirt Inc to edit that specific filing. So as you can see in this example, both Jane and Phil, the two registered users of Big Dirt Inc now have access to that one specific filing. A couple of things that are important to note is that the notice access, this is provided at the company level as the contractual arrangements here are made between the companies, not the individuals. And then when utilizing this notice access option, the users of Big Dirt Inc, they will not have that ability to complete the notice filing or pay any fees on behalf of Soil Co. So that part and all of the declaration forms must be completed by Soil Co. So to give a bit more context and to drill a little bit deeper into that first example where Bob has added his colleague Sarah to his account as an additional user, You'll see from this slide that there are multiple user access levels which are available that have different permissions as well. So by default, the user who creates that account is gonna be the administrator of the account. And you'll need to contact Ripper to change the account admin after that account has been created. The admin has the ability to enroll in programs such as the XS Soil program. They can create or disable any of those users and they can perform all of those functions within the program. They're also that primary user um, by default and until that's, that's changed. There's only one primary user that's assigned per program and they have that ability to add in secondary users. They can add or edit filing data. They can make payments and they can also submit those filings. And then finally, we have the secondary user. They have the lowest set of permissions. They can edit data, make payments or submit filings but can't really manage any of the user access. So then to drill a little bit deeper into that shared notice access as well. And in our demo this morning, I will walk through how to manage the shared notice access. As a bit of a reminder, this is where that company can assign notice access to one or more specific filings to another company to work on. So before I do that, there's just a couple of important things to note with regards to notice access as well. Firstly, only those users from the company that initiated the filing can actually assign notice access to another company. And the company who receives that notice access, they must also be registered within the Excess Soil program. Again, I can show this in the demonstration. So there are certain limitations to what the company receiving access can do. So 
Although they can edit most of the filing details, they're actually unable to manage that notice access themselves. They cannot complete the initial final submission. They cannot make those payments and they cannot see any financial information. Okay, so now that we have a bit of a handle on the fundamentals, it's my pleasure to jump into the account creation process for the registry portal. Okay, so this is the registry sign-in page. I'm gonna zoom in slightly in case it's smaller on everybody else's screens. So yeah, this is the registry sign-in page. If you've already got a registry account, you can sign in here. But if you don't have an account, and this is what we're going to be working on for the pretense of this demo, you can click on the don't have an account, create a new account button. So a couple of things that I want to point out on this page. Firstly, throughout the registry itself, you're going to see that there are chevrons indicating your progress through certain processes or the filing itself. So these are those four chevrons at the top here. You also think, see these information icons, these popover buttons, they provide extra information which relate to that particular field or page. You can click on these for more information to help guide you through making a filing. So each new account should enter a CRA business number. This is our unique identifier. So you need a, your own CRA business number here. But if you don't have that CRA business number, you can contact our PRA and they will be able to help you out. So I'm going to enter in our business number here. And then I'll enter in our legal business name here. If I so choose, I can click on the copy legal name button and this will pre-fill my details into the business operating name field as well. Okay, so as you can see, those chevrons at the top of the page have been updated to show our progress so far. And that'll be reflected through any process uh, when making a filing. So on this page, you're gonna be required to enter in your business address and your phone number. One of the things I wanted to show on this page is if you try to skip ahead to the next part, you'll see that the fields that are required and are missing so far and require your input are highlighted in red and there's a validation message underneath it. So the registry has been designed so that we pick up all of the required information and you are prompted if anything is missing. Okay, so for my address, I'm gonna throw in I'm gonna enter my phone number here as well. Okay. Once I'm happy with all the information that exists on this page, I can click the next step button. Okay. So on this page, we're being asked to enter in our personal profile information. And immediately you can see in red text here that a link will be sent to the email you provide to complete your account registration. So although of course, all of the information on this page is important, is extremely important that you get your email correct as you will be sent a link to validate your account. The other information on this page, such as your, your phone number here, uh, will be used for the two-factor authentication, which you may have seen on some websites around the internet already, which is when you log in, you will be sent a code in order to validate your login. And you can choose to have that sent to you by email, text, or a phone call. So I'm gonna throw in my details here. Okay, then I have the option here because I've already pre uh, filled in a bunch of information already. I can click the copy business address and the information about my business has been pulled through. But again, because we rely on accurate information for that two-factor authentication, I am asked to re-enter my business phone number here. And I can check on this box to copy my business phone number into the mobile phone number field. Okay, so on this page, we're on that final Chevron, the review Chevron. This is our review page. And essentially it means just that. This is a page that allows you to review the data that has been entered so far. 
Should any of this information look incorrect or you want to make a change, you can click on the edit button here to be taken back to that particular page where you can change some of the details. Let's say I had the wrong phone number. I can change that information here. Click on next step and roll back to that review page once more. As you see on the bottom right hand side here, this button has been grayed out and you may see this throughout the registry as well. When information has not been completed on that page that is required to, this button here may be grayed out, which indicates you are still missing something. So I can see that I'm missing the checkbox to agree to the registry terms of use. I can click on this link here to open up the registry terms of use and read through them. Once I've read through them, I can press that close button and I can check the checkbox to indicate that I agree to those terms of use. Now, as I said, and as you can see from the instructions on this page, you will be sent an email to activate your account, which is why it's extremely important to make sure that email address is correct. I'm going to copy the link that I need to send to click on here and paste that information in here. Okay, so now that the account has been activated, we must now set that password. As you can see, there are certain password requirements here. And as you create your password, you will see a checkbox indicate that you have met that requirement. I click on set password, and now my account has been created and activated. So this stage, this is our program enrollment page, and I have the option to select the program that I'd like to enroll in. So of course, for the purposes of this demo, we're going to click on that excess soil program. So I click on this icon, and then I can confirm that this is the program that I wish to register in. Now that I've registered for the program, the excess soil icon has been moved to the top and has been highlighted in green. So before I move forward with the SOIL program itself, I just want to show a couple of the other options that you have at this stage. In the top right hand side of the screen, of course, we have a logout button. But if you click on your name here, you have four other options that are available to you. My profile allows you to go back in and view and edit some of the information associated with your personal profile. Change password does exactly what it says on the tin. My business profile allows you to review the information you entered for your business. And then the final one is manage users, which I'm going to go into in a little more detail now. So by clicking on that manage users button, I'm brought to a new page where I can do, well, exactly that. I can manage the users for my account. So as a reminder, the account admin, um, and that's George here, myself, they are set as the primary user by default. You see on this page that there are two tables. Top table is going to show our active users from my business in the registry. And then the bottom one is going to show users that are inactive. So the manage users feature as a whole is particularly useful if I'm going to be in an organization that maybe has multiple people or um, yeah, multiple people who may need to log in to create, update, or, or submit those filings. By having this, this ability here to, to add in multiple users, I don't need to share any passwords or login details with everyone. And then as the admin, I can also manage everyone's access from this one page. So if I wanted to provide registry access to another user, I would click on this add new user button. And then here I'm prompted to enter in the email address for a user. So I can put in the email address of another user what it's going to do is search the registry to see if any other users have already registered with that email. And if so, we can pull through their information. Of course, Sarah Jones doesn't yet exist in the registry, so I'm able to enter in her information here. So I'm going to add Sarah Jones. I can click this button to say that my mobile phone number is the same as my business phone number. I can select the program. Of course, at this point, I'm only enrolled in the one program, the Excess Soil program. And then as you'll remember from the slide deck, this is where we can define the user access level. So I'm gonna add Sarah as a secondary user to my account, click on the authorization checkbox and click on save. Okay. 
So you can see here that Sarah has been added to this top table of active users. And now I have a couple of new options available to me. I can click on manage, which allows me to manage Sarah's access. I can remove her access to the program, change her program, change her user access level. I can also click on the disable button, which would just completely disable her account and preventing her from login. So Sarah, in a similar way that just happened to our primary user, George Chilton here, she will be sent an email instructing her to verify and activate her account. Okay, so to go back to the program selection screen, I'm gonna click on the back to programs button, top left, and now I'm back to my program selection screen. To go into the Access Soil program itself, I can click on the green Access Soil icon, and this is gonna take me to the Access Soil Registry homepage. So this is the page that's gonna show me a summary of all of those filings that I've started, the ones I've completed, or ones that have been provided, uh, shared with me by another company. You'll see that the table can be sorted by clicking on the column headings here. Of course, I don't have any entries at this point, but I could sort those columns here. And so the next step that I'd like to demonstrate is to show you how to initiate that new notice and to assign notice access. So to initiate a new notice, I click on the initiate new but notice button on the top right. Then after being shown a disclaimer, and click on through. And I'm brought to that notice filing selection page, which you may recognize from the slide deck as well. So for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to select the RDSD notice and just click on next to move to the next screen. So as with each of the filing types, I'm going to be required to go through some basic pre-screening and eligibility criteria and to certify their accuracy by checking on the checkbox at the bottom here. So for an RDSD, and again, we are gonna do a training video for an RDSD notice filing itself. But I know that the answers to these questions are no, yes, no, yes. Certify that information is correct and move forwards. Again, as with each of those filing types, I must indicate my role in order to be able to begin the actual filing process. For each of the filing types, there are different contacts who are associated with the filing who are able to initiate that notice filing. This is separate from entering the contact details, which we'll do a little bit later on, uh, the contact details of those associated with the filing. And this is used to track the role of the user who initiates. So for an RDSD filing, this is where you're gonna be able to indicate your role as an owner, an operator, or that authorized person. So as all of the role selection screens are going to be covered at a later stage when we visit those filing submission processes, for the purposes of just this demo, I'm, I'm going to select owner so that we can quickly progress with initiating the filing. Okay, so similar to that account creation page, you will notice that there are five new chevrons at the top of this page to indicate our progress through making a filing. This page is our notice access page. And as you can see, this is the page that's going to summarize that uh, which companies have been provided access to the particular notice. So I'll give it a little bit of a reminder again that providing the company with notice access, this isn't a required step, this is an optional step. So you can click on save and next to progress without assigning any notice access to anyone else. But of course, for the purposes of this demo, let's say that I would like to provide notice access to another company, perhaps because I've contracted with that company to complete the filing on my behalf. So to start this process, I would click on the manage notice access button. And this button opens up a pop-up for me to manage that notice access. As you can see, I've not yet assigned anybody any notice access, so there are no users currently visible. In order to assign that access, I click on the add company button. And this is going to bring up this search bar here that allows me to search for a company that I would like to provide notice access to. So that first step of assigning notice access to another company is to search for the company name. The system is going to search for all of the companies that are currently registered in the Access Soil program. So 
If a company is not in the list or you cannot find it after making a search, then recommend that they sign up for a excess soil program account. Another thing to remember here is that access to this notice, it's going to be provided to all of the users, at, all of the registered users, I should say, at the selected company. So if you remember back to our slide deck, let's say that I wanted to give access to my consultancy at Big Dirt Inc. I would search for Big Dirt Inc. I can click on Big Dirt Inc's name. And then you'll see that the system has selected the contact details of a person already at the company. So by default, this is the primary contact for their account. However, if you click on the drop down menu, you can choose who should be your contact. It's a bit of a reminder again, all of those users of Big Dirt Inc. will have access to the notice. So the role of the screen is to be able to assign one person as your contact. If you're working with multiple people at this company, so if I was working with multiple people at Big Dirt, I would still only need to select one contact person. This is also the person who will receive that notification email that their company has been provided with notice access to my filing. As I select a different contact on the list, you will see that their contact email address updates on the right-hand side. Then by default, this access to this filing checkbox is checked as the assumption is going to be that you wish to provide access to that person that you've just selected. And then in a second, I'm going to discuss revoking access. So in order to save this page and uh, save the access provided here, I'm gonna click on this checkbox and then click the save button. So we see now that this notice access page has been updated to show the name of the company that has been given access to my filing, Big Dirt Inc. I can then hover over this view button. I can see some extra details about the company. And I can also see the name of the contact, Lance Roop, that I've chosen at that company. So it's probably a good time, just a bit of a reminder about providing notice access to somebody in this way so that when someone has been provided with shared notice access, there are some things that they can and they cannot do. So a company with notice access, they cannot submit the filing, they cannot make the payments, and they cannot see any of that financial information. They also cannot see or even edit this notice access page itself. But then other than that, a company with notice access can complete a filing in pretty much the same way that you might. So next, let's assume that I wish to revoke that notice access that I provided to Big Dirt Inc. At any time, I can come back to this notice access tab. I can click on the manage notice access button and I can uncheck the access to this filing box. I just go through the confirmation again, click on save. Oh, I think I missed the button. Oh, I'll try that one more time. Revoke the access, goodness, click on save. Okay, well, we will check that one, but this will revoke the access from the page here. Okay, my final step that I wanted to talk about here is just a reminder that this is an optional step. It's not required in order to progress with a filing, um, and it's just providing that functionality to share this particular filing with another company if you require their assistance in completing that notice, if so desired. So this is actually concluding the registry portal portion of the training session. Uh, we've covered creating the account, managing user access, initiating the filing, and providing that shared notice access as well. So what we'll do now is jump back to the deck for a few slides about the public portal, and then we will come back for a live demo of that system as well. Okay. So as with that training for the registry portal, there are just a few points I'd like to cover in advance with respect of the public portal before we jump into the demonstration itself. So I will provide just that brief overview of the public portal, explain how to access it, and then I'll explain the visibility of the filing information to the public. So fairly self-explanatory, but the public portal is accessible by the public and important to note that there's no sign up or registration 
of an account required by the public to access that public portal. Our public portal users, they can see all of those filings that are at the initial, the updated or final submission status, but they won't be able to see any of those in progress filings. So those are the filings that are of course in progress and before any submission has actually been made. Furthermore, users on the public portal, they will not be able to see any financial information, any payment information, um, but they will be able to see related PDFs as well. So the link to actually access the public portal is listed here, accesssoilnotices.rpra.ca. So before any user can actually access that public portal, they will need to pass a Google Capture Challenge. This is required in order to help protect the personal information that is visible to the public. So you may have seen this on a website you've visited before. It's usually a, a set of images, select the buses, the traffic lights, the palm trees, something like that. So you must select the correct options in order to confirm that you as a user are a real person and that you're not a spam robot looking for email addresses or contact information. So once that's been passed, you'll be taken on to the public portal here. So finally, and on my last slide before I actually open up the public portal itself, it's important to understand what information is actually going to be visible to the public. So in essence, all of the information that is included in those submitted filings is going to be visible to the public, but there are a few exceptions. You will not be able to see the contact details for any person who has been selected as a site contact, listed here. They also will not be able to see any invoice or financial payment information. So the rest of the slide really shows that there are varying sections for each of those filing types. But you, as you can see from the chart, pretty much all information is included and visible to the public with just those exceptions of the fee related data. Okay, so now it's my pleasure to jump into a demonstration of the public portal as well. Let's open up the right tab here. Correct. Okay, so once you've, once you've followed the link to access the public portal, as I said, you may see a capture challenge here, and this is gonna be required to pass before anybody's able to see any of that public data. I can check the check mark. This time it's not asking me to verify any images, so I can click on submit and then access the homepage. So on the registry homepage, on the public portal homepage here, the user is able to see a list of notices. As a reminder, the notices that are, will appear on the public experience are those that have that status of initial submission, updated submission, or a final submission. So by default, all of the notices with those, one of those three submission statuses will show on the public portal, but we do have the ability to filter through the results by using this search box up here. The fields that we can search by, we can search by the notice ID, the site or the project name, the community, which is defined as the municipality or First Nation community, an address, or the company name. So I'll show what this looks like if we were to search by one particular notice ID. So if I knew that my notice ID that I wanted to find was 21, enter that in and you can see that the results have been updated below. Next, if I wanted to search by a site or project name, let's say I knew that it was something to do with Crosstown, I could search for the word Crosstown and see all filings that have that site or project name. If I wanted to look a little closer to home and I wanted to see the filings that were in my neighborhood or my community, I could search by my area and this would pull up all of the filings that were happening in my community. Next, I can search by an address. I knew that the address of the site was 16, 606 Bathurst. This would pull up the filing associated with that particular address. Now, when searching by the company name, what the system does is it searches by the company name of those contacts who have been attached 
or added to the filing. And it also searches for the name of the initiating company. So if I was to search for Soil Management Inc, I could see the four filings that Soil Management Inc has initiated. But if I search for the word Gallagher, Gallagher may be the name of a company associated with a qualified person associated with that filing. That would pull up their information here as well. So I'll do a bit more of a deeper dive into uh, a filing itself. I'm gonna pull up that filing 21 again. The public can click on this view button here. And here we have the filing itself. So I've zoomed in a little bit to make it nice and easy for everybody to see. So this filing is at the updated submission status. Filings with a submission status of in progress or updated, in, uh, sorry, in updated submission or initial submission, I should say, will have five sections that are visible. This first section is the filing detail section. This is a bit of a basic summary about the information associated with this particular filing. You can see the notice ID, the type, company name, a submission status. And then we also have an initial submission date and a last modified date. On the next section, we have access for the user to download a PDF of the declaration that was uploaded when making that initial submission. Our third section has details about the contact details or the contacts that are associated with this particular filing, including their name, company, phone, email address, address, and their contact type. A bit further down, we have the summary of all of the site details including any site instrument details. Now this is specific to an RDSD filing and I'll point out that for each of the different filing types, there may be varying questions and sections associated. And if I scroll down a bit further, we have the soil deposit details. This is the details of the soil information that we have so far. So that is a filing at the updated submission status. If we go back to the registry again, and I want to select a submission which is at the final submission status, I can click on view for filing number 25. So we will be doing a deeper dive into the project area notice filing in another training session on November 30th, but this has a very similar setup to what we've just seen for the RDSD summary. We have the filing details section here. One thing to note is that instead of the last updated date, we have that final submission date as a filing in final submission can no longer be updated. So we have no last updated date. We just have the final submission date. You notice under declarations that the public can access both the initial declaration, which is required in order to make that initial submission, and also the final declaration as was required to make that final submission. We still have our contact details. And then instead of the site detail section for a project area filing, we refer to it as our project detail section. And you can see all of the information. Again, we will do a deeper dive into this over the next few days. Full section is our soil detail section. And then finally, we have our excavated soil details. So this is our final detail section. So once that submission has been moved forwards to a final submission, that is when you will have the final fields entered below. So should a member of the public actually wish to download or, or print one of these filings, we do recommend that they use the browser's inbuilt functionality. So depending on your browser, it may look like something like clicking here and then clicking on print in order to be able to save that information as a PDF, or I could probably send that to the PwC printer. Okay, so we are a little bit ahead of time coming up to 10 a.m. here, but that concludes the demonstration of the, the public portal and my portion of the training session. So I will gladly now pass it back to Pam, I believe. Great. Uh, thanks, John. So, um, as we had mentioned earlier um, in the presentation, um, RIPRA will be holding uh, additional 
uh, sessions. Uh, one of these is on November 30th, so next Tuesday. Uh, and that one is focused on demonstrating the process of starting, um, of initiating and finishing a, sorry, on initiating, updating, and finalizing a project area notice filing. Uh, we'll go through the steps of, of how that process flow works, um, how to submit payment as well, and how to make updates to the notice filing itself. Um, so if you haven't registered for that, uh, for that session, please do so on our website. Um, and then we're, ho we're hosting our third one uh, on December the 2nd, uh, next Thursday. And that'll be uh, walking through the process of the same sort of thing of initiating, updating, and uh, finalizing a reuse filing. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's important to, to, to call out that the support doesn't end there. Uh, RPRA is committed to supporting users through learning tools and assistance in using the registry. So, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we are recording this session. It will be posted live on our website. Uh, we will do the same for the reuse and project area uh, notice filing so that it's accessible for, for everyone and you can access it and, and use it as a resource. As John mentioned earlier as well, we will be doing a uh, pre-recorded video of how to file uh, an RDSD notice filing, and that will also be available in the coming weeks. Um, and again, once we actually uh, go live, uh, we will have a dedicated um, support team um, who will be able to answer any questions as it relates to, to using the registry, um, troubleshoot any technical support related questions, uh, be able to offer support as it relates to, to using the system. Um, and on our website, we will have walkthrough guides uh, specific to each notice filing available. Um, it'll, the walkthrough guides will also include some FAQs um, and some definitions. Um, and then as well on our website, we will have additional resources um, and important links either to the regulation or directing you uh, to, to content from the ministry as well. So um, we're very excited to be launching on December 1st. Um, and we're, we're in a very, we're, we're thrilled that we'll be able to support all of the users in, in um, completing and initiating their, their notice filing. So I think we'll leave it now to, to answer some of the questions that have been trickling through as John has um, done the demo. So uh, Isabella, if I could get your help. Yeah, so just a reminder that um, you can upvote any questions you would like answered uh, live. I think we have enough time, hopefully, to get through all of them. But just in case, um, please use the upvote feature for any questions that you see in the Q&A uh, that you would like answered live. So the first one we have uh, is from Jeff. Um, and he asks, for large municipalities with multiple divisions and service areas, is there only one account for the entire municipality with multiple users or would each division or service area create their own account? Okay, so um, it's my understanding, uh, well, the registry itself, uh, it has a unique identifier and that is the CRA number. Um, so in theory, uh, only one account can be created by the municipality. Um, and then you can add as many users um, as the, you know, the municipality sees fit. Um, I think it's important to, to, to know as well that the municipality may also participate in different programs. Um, so this is why it's, um, it, it, a, a user should, an, an individual user shouldn't be creating an account. It, it really is at the company level. And so, if, I, I, yeah, so I, I, I don't imagine that divisions will have individual CRA numbers. Um, so it would be, again, at the, the full municipal level. Thank you, Pam. Uh, next question. Oh, also a reminder, if you're asking a question, please um, make sure your name is um, 
you have your name uh, as an attendee, just because we will keep these for our records, but also if we have to answer them in writing, it's useful to know who asked the question. Um, so the next question is from In Shun, and he, uh, they, they ask, how will employees of municipalities be able to create an account without a CRABN? So um, if, uh, if you do not have a, a CRA number, um, there is a way where uh, if you call registry support, we'll be able to give you a number to utilize. Um, so you can, you can contact us for that support. But again, just to be clear, individuals should not be creating an account for themselves. Again, the account is at the company level and at the corporation level. Thank you, Pam. Uh, the next question, in your slides, uh, does authorized person equate to qualified person, QP, for the ministry's definition? So, no, the qualified person uh, remains um, what is stipulated in the reg, so that is a professional engineer or a geoscientist, an authorized person as it relates to the registry itself. Uh, that is a person who, or a company who has been uh, given permission uh, by the owner, operator, or project leader uh, of the company responsible for filing the notice. Um, they will have an account within the system and they will tick a box within the registry that says, I am authorized to uh, initiate and submit the notice filing on behalf of the project leader, owner, or operator uh, of a company. Um, thank you. Uh, next question is from Shaw, uh, Shane. Um, our municipal compliance team has a shared email account. Can the name of our compliance team and shared email be used to enter in the account contract information for our reg regional municipalities account? Um, so I, I think this ties into the fact that uh, what we discussed earlier that uh, the registry is uh, a secure sort of, um, we, we don't encourage passwords to be shared. So when an account is created, you can add multiple users and those multiple users are unique um, to, uh, to an email address, right? So um, anybody, you can, you can have as many users within the account as you see fit. Um, so I, I I wouldn't encourage that um, a contact is added uh, and, and used as an email address with, where multiple people can access it. Um, there, again, there's that functionality of the two-factor authentication um, and it, everything should, should be unique to, to a single user. Okay, thank you, Pam. Uh, next question is from Monisa. Please confirm there's no cost to set up an account. Yes, there is no cost to set up an account. There is no cost to add users. Um, the fee uh, is enabled depending on the type of notice filing uh, that the person is initiating. Um, and again, depending on a certain threshold um, as it relates to, to a specific notice filing. Um, there is also the functionality uh, to voluntarily file a notice. Um, and, and that's for, for, for a few reasons I was consulted with the ministry. But again, if, if you voluntarily file a notice and you are below a certain threshold, there, there, there may not be a fee as well. Thank you, Pam. Um, this one is from an anonymous attendee. Is there a fee associated with additional users or is there simply an account fee? Um, so um, just to clarify again, no fees for account creation, no fees for additional users, uh, potentially um, having to submit a fee to RIPRA, uh, if depending on the notice filing. Okay, um, next is from James. If you're acting as a QP for a source site and have been assigned the task of completing the notice filing, 
what registration is required prior to you being provided notice access by the project leader? Okay, so that's a good or question. Owner of the site. Yeah. So you can only be provided notice access through that functionality if you have an existing or, or if you create an account and have an existing um, if the company exists within the registry. So uh, you would be able to support uh, the contents of, of completing a notice filing um, if you're set up uh, as an account and, and you have and, and the company has given you that access. So the requirement is create an account uh, within the company, add users, and then the company that wants your, your support on filing that notice can add you um, as, as a user. Thank you, Pat. Uh, next is from Gail. Uh, please clarify, contact details for each notice are public. So there are specific things that are public. Uh, I believe it's the owner, uh, operator, and project leader information. Um, the, I think the only information that isn't available on the public registry is the site contact details. But anything else as it relates to um, um, the details, the contact details of the owner, the operator, or the project leader, that will be available uh, on the public registry. Thank you, Pat. Uh, next is from Mike. How many secondary users can be added? Uh, as many uh, as the company sees fit, there, there's, there's no limitation. Thank you, Pam. Um, next is from Kyle. Does each user from a company get to register a unique phone number for two-factor authentication, or is this limited to the original registration, i.e. the administrator? That's a good question. So the two-factor authentication will be enabled uh, for every user. So once you're added uh, as a primary or secondary user uh, within the account, uh, you will provide a, your email address and a phone number. And I think you can also provide a, a cell phone number. And then you can, uh, as long as that is your own information, you will get that verification code sent, sent to you. Thank you. Uh, next is from Charlene. What if a company has multiple locations? So again, I think um, we just want to clarify as well that um, let, let's just use uh, Walmart as an example, as a company who may have several offices. Um, it'll still have a unique CRA number. So they would register um, the company with that CRA number and then add users from different offices if, if they work in different places. So I think it's important to clarify that like the company will have a unique CRA number and that's, that's the information that we input when you create the account. Okay. Thank you. Um, from Jeff. Does access to the public portal require the user to create an account? No, uh, there is no account uh, creation process for the public portal, but you will have to um, go through that CAPTCHA um, feature to be able to view the details on the public registry. Thank you, Pam. Uh, next is from Aaron. When you created the account, it defaulted to primary user access. The slide deck mentioned another level, account administrator. Where or how is this level of access created? Okay, so, um, and I'm gonna just, for, for John to keep me honest here. So when the account is created, uh, the administrator uh, defaults to the primary uh, user. Um, there, they're the administrator um, of the account is the person who can um, is the person who enrolls in the programs, and then from that from that point can add users and assign them to specific program enrollments, and then the primary user 
can then add secondary users within that program moment. Uh, but the admin, when you create the account, the admin is defaulted also to the primary user, if that makes sense. I hope that, John, that, that's correct, right? <laughs> yeah, you got it, you got it, Pam, that's right. Okay. Great, right, thank you, Pam. Uh, next is from Karen. For companies with different project areas uh, with different CRA numbers, will they need different email addresses for each CRA number? Yes, because so the CRA number is a unique identifier. And then when you provide contact details of, of the admin or the primary user, it will be a unique email address as well. Thank you. Uh, this one's from Jeremy. What are the minimum amounts of SOAR that do not need to be registered slash tracked for reuse? So I think uh, that's more of a regulatory question. Um, so uh, I, I won't answer that here, but we will take it back um, and, um, and send it along to, to the, the folks from the ministry. Um, uh, the next one, will a fee schedule be distributed to users? I could help answer that. Uh, yes, it will be. Uh, we're working on finalizing our fees. So we had the fee consultation process and it is currently um, in the process of being presented to our board um, based on the feedback that we got from, uh, from everybody who attended and gave feedback on the fees. So we hope to have the fees posted by December 1st and that will be communicated to everybody on our mailing list. Um, if you are not on the mailing list, uh, I think the, oh no, we don't have the email address on these slides. The email address is available on our website if you would like to be added to um, the mailing list. And maybe I can share that information in the Q&A section. Uh, okay, so the next question is from Manisa. Please clarify, how will payment work if a municipality can only set up one account? Can only the account administrator pay the fee? Uh, no, so that's a good question. So when the um, notice is submitted, um, there will be... Um, an invoice generated by the system. Uh, and that invoice will have the details of the company, the details of the filing in terms of like what, what filing this invoice is associated with. And it will have the contact details of the person who submitted the notice. Um, and then depending on your um, selection of P, uh, fee, <laughs> selection of payments, uh, method of payment, um, you, the, the person who submitted the notice will get an email giving them instructions on how to submit that payment. And then it would be a business process uh, from the company to determine how that invoice is going to get paid. Um, so if you, will, if, if you select the check option, you, know, you, you would take that internally and with your own business process, determine who would pay that invoice. Um, but it, it's not associated to a specific person per se. Um, so that is a separate function from the registry. So each company will have to determine how, um, how the invoice gets paid. Thank you. Our next one is also on fees. How are the fees invoice slash paid? So we do have, so maybe I'll elaborate that we have, I wanna say five payment options. Um, the one that's done, there are two, I think, that are done in real time. Uh, so there's credit card option, credit card payment, uh, there's check, there's bank withdrawal, uh, EFT, and um, I'm forgetting the other one. Uh, it's, I'm forgetting the last fee. Um, uh, payment method, but we do have several options uh, for, for users to submit that payment. And again, 
once the notice is initiated uh, and depending on uh, the method that you select, um, an email will be sent that provides instructions on how to finalize that payment. Okay, thank you, Pam. Um, one from an anonymous attendee. Is there a way to hide personal information, email and phone numbers on the public portal? Um, so it's my understanding that um, that information uh, will is a requirement uh, to be made public, um, and so we will it, we can't remove that functionality. So, but again, it's it's only of the owner or operator. Uh, it's of the owner operator and project leader, um, and again, these these individuals will be responsible um, for filing that notice, so that information is made public. Thank you. Um, next from Resham, uh, Risham, can the account admin or the account bearer representing an organization be changed at any time? So the account administrator can be changed, but you will have to contact uh, RIPRA uh, to sort of make, um, so we can discuss the options. It's not something that's enabled within the register that you can do yourself for the account admin, but um, primary users and secondary users can always be disabled or enabled. But the account admin function, you would have to call registry support to get assistance with that. Thank you. Uh, next is from Aaron again. What safeties, if any, are present in the event that the account administrator or original, original primary access is lost? So if that is, if, if, I imagine this is a question if somebody perhaps leaves the organization and somebody needs to access the account, uh, then you would call RIPRA and, and we, we, would, we would discuss the options to, to help you um, change um, the user within the account. Okay, thank you. Um, Next from Gail again, can one account be created for multiple CRA numbers or is it one account per number? It's one account per CRA number. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Hill asked, what's the billing cycle and any penalties for late payment? So there, traditionally there is, um, I, I want to say that on the invoice, uh, it says due on receipt, and I think it's 30 days. Um, yeah, so um, understanding if that, if that takes longer, uh, you know, you're more than welcome to, like if, if the internal business process is that payment um, is done maybe at the end of the month or, or anything like that, where you, you, you pay invoices, uh, please contact us. Like, we're, we're, we're happy to have a, that conversation and that, and that dialogue. Okay, thank you, Pam. Uh, Jeff asked, would RPRA staff be willing to conduct training for individual mun municipalities if they wish? Um, I'm not, that's, I, I, I'm unsure if that's, uh, I don't wanna say it's out of scope, uh, but on December 3rd, I think it's next Friday, we will be participating in a um, in a webinar um, with AMO and the ministry, uh, and we will be um, in, in that webinar as well to be able to answer any questions as it relates to the registry. Um, so I'll, I'll, I hope uh, maybe that doesn't fully answer the question, but <laughs> there will be another opportunity to answer questions as it relates to the registry at, at that webinar that is being held by the ministry and AMO. Thank you, Pam. Um, one from Imshin. Does the declaration form require the project leader to have authorization to bind the corporation? Um, that's a good question. And I want to say um, that the ministry owns the declaration uh, in terms of attesting to the information that's provided in the, in the filing and, and say, you know, 
I confirmed several criteria. I don't believe there's any mention of binding the corporation, uh, but we do have the um, declarations available on our website. Um, so if you go to the uh, excess soils, if you go to ripra.ca and then in the programs, you find excess soils registry, you'll see in the resources section that we have the declaration forms available for, for download and review. Thank you. Um, can you have multiple authorized persons? Sorry, can you repeat that? Can you have a multiple authorized person? Uh, so I think um, when an account is created, um, the authorized person is identified within each uh, notice filing when that's initiated. Um, so in theory, like I don't wanna say like the authorized person is an identification when the notice filing is initiated, but any user within that account can be an authorized person uh, for a specific project if they've been given that permission by the owner, operator, or project leader um, uh, of a project. Thank you. Uh, one for Mark, how will this work for an organization like the MTO, one account, numerous users? I guess that's the CRA uh, number point as well. How will this work for an organization like the MTO, one account, numerous users? Yes, yes, one account. Um, the next one is from... Albany, when registering a business with a registry, can more than one person slash email be identified as a user manager? I guess as the main account holder. So each account will have one admin user. And again, that admin user will um, identify who can be a primary user within the program enrollment. Um, and then that primary user can add multiple people uh, as secondary users uh, within that program that, that you're enrolled in. Um, if, I think that answers that question. Um, one from Don, public portal. Can you sort filings by two fields, i.e. type like such as RS or, and municipality such as Hamilton? I think it's, only by one, um, so either be the municipality, um, is that correct, John? <laughs> yes, you're correct. Yeah. So you can search okay. by one field at a time, but you do have the ability to sort your search results by one of those column headings. So you, in this particular example, you could search for the municipality Hamilton, and then you could sort the results by the project type to bring your reuse filings to the top. Okay, thank you. Um, next, does a registry require an administrator who manages user accounts or can individual project leaders create an account on their own? So um, in theory, a, a project leader, um, like again, when you create an account, it's, it's specific to a company it's not specific to one person. Um, so um, ideally there would be a, a, an account created and then users are added depending on who needs to, to be given access within the account. Okay. Um, I think we're almost at time, so I will say any of these questions that we haven't answered live, we will, and which are related to the registry, uh, we will collate and do our best to answer them in writing. And we'll share that information uh, with you all by email. Um, so hopefully 
if your question hasn't been answered, we will get that to you in writing. Um, uh, and hopefully most of the most uh, important questions that you were hoping to be answered today have been answered. So before we wrap up, uh, just on the next slide, please, John, uh, we would just like to get some quick feedback, just two short questions from you uh, about how you found uh, the session today. Um, so I'm about to launch a poll. Uh, if you could just quickly uh, respond to those two que questions, that would be really useful for us uh, to know how we did. Okay, I can see that. Hello? Uh, John, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the slide has been updated. I can't see it on my end. Uh, but I think that is the slide with the information, uh, or our contact information. Um, there we go. Thank you. Um, so if you would like to find out more about the registry uh, project, um, and there's some information there about fees as well, I know there are a few questions about the fee process, please visit uh, our dedicated page for the XSO registry. Um, there are lots of links there, and as Pam mentioned, there are links to things like uh, the ministry's uh, page about the regulations, so there's more information there if you want that, and also some links to... Um, things like the declaration forms. We will also be adding training materials, including this video once it's available and the presentation slides uh, to that page. And that is the page you will go to to um, file your notice, uh, to start filing notice filings on Monday, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, the 1st of December, once the registry is officially live. If you have any questions about the registry, please feel free to email us at registry at rpra.ca. We have a registry support team who are ready and willing to answer any questions that you have. So I think that brings us to the end of today's session. Uh, any final words, Pam? Um, no, I think thank you for everyone for participating. We had some great questions and uh, we look forward to the next sessions in the next coming days and we look forward to supporting you uh, when you um, come and use the registry portal starting next week. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.